Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have each morning to study your word together. We uh, invite your spirit into our hearts, into our lives, that you can effect a change upon us, that we can reflect Christ's character. We need your presence. We ask, Lord, that you can give us wisdom and understanding as we continue to study Judges chapter 16. Help us to put these upon a line correctly and to understand uh, the truth for this time. Be with each person searching these things out, whether they're in person, through the internet, or whether they're watching these videos at a latter time. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be present. May your angels watch over each one throughout this day and uh, be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everyone. Um, now, um, I had to restart my computer yesterday, so some of my stuff isn't open yet. But we can see here in Judges chapter 16, we had uh, um, began looking at this story of Delilah. And I went over some of the videos that we had done before, and it seems like we skipped a lot. Now, one is we were, um, as Dwight was doing the presentations with his notes, and we were following through those, and we read a lot of Spirit of Prophecy. And uh, the moral lessons from the story of Samson are pretty clear that Samson on the surface represents this uh, basically, human nature. Um, so one of the things that we've, uh, we struggle with is that we know that the story uh, is a symbol of Christ, but it's morally ironic. So that, that always causes us this difficulty. And so we know that when we're looking at this um, Trying to find something here. Okay. So I got this chart. You know, I can share this here. Um, right. So we had we had gone over that section of of judges. 15, which we had finished up, and I'm going to be drawing another chart here. So we want to be able to put Judges 16 on a line. So I'm just copying this here. This is not going to be. And, and so the question that we have to ask in this, this story is how do we address this on a line. So just be another line with different different verses. Okay, so we had Judges sixteen verse one. So that's so we didn't we didn't finish putting that on a line, other than we know that judges. Um, Judges 16 verse 1 is is what? Okay. 
So what is Judges 16, verse 1? First day of the 16th month. Okay. The 16th day of the first month. But yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any calendar with the 16th month, but I, I knew what you meant. Okay. So, so if we're going to do it this way, we would put that as Judges 16, verse 1. Now, this, we had, uh, this February, this was actually 15, verse 1. Right? That was the wheat harvest. So we can see that these are switched around. So this is the wave offering. So I'll put that in here. And this is going to be the wheat harvest. Uh, maybe I'll put um, two loaves. Maybe I could even do it. Maybe I'll just do it this way. Pentecost. So that story at the beginning of chapter 15 continues from chapter 14 and the story at the beginning of chapter 15 um, is, is a different story, but I think it connects. So in chapter 16, I think that connects more to chapter 15. It's more continuous from chapter 15. And so those are tied together and we have this 49 days, right? Between uh, the wave offering and Pentecost plus also between Collins and Odilio's presentations. So people satisfied with that, what I'm doing there? So what we don't know is we look at at um, Judges 16.4, um, this, this isn't going to be a continuation of this, right? So I don't know how to deal with this, but could we argue that this line is going to go in reverse? Does that make sense to anybody? Or am I just... What do you mean by reverse? Well, it's going to go backwards. But this story here, I mean, we're going to have these four uh, tests, right? So we have here in this story, we're going to start at 16.4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sark, whose name was Delilah. Right. And then we're going to have the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, entice him and see where in his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him. So we're going to have these four tests. And um, these tests are, uh, well, there's also going to be this price that's going to be paid that they're going to offer, and we've taken the position that it's 1,100 pieces of silver, and that each one of them, and so uh, um, each man will give her uh, 1,100 pieces of silver, but we take it as this is all together, that each of them are going to contribute. So each would present 220 pieces of silver each of these lords of the Philistines, since there are five of them. So if we take the five, what do they represent? So let's, let's first deal with the symbols, and then we'll go back to that, that line again. 
So if we're going to deal with five, five is a symbol of wise and foolish. Yep. Yeah, so the wise and foolish. Okay. Now. Now, this 1,100 pieces of silver, how did we understand that? If we took it as time, it would be three years and four and a quarter days. And four and a quarter days is 6,120 minutes. which is two and six in reverse. Could also be the 16th day of the second month. Could be different things. <clears throat> but can we take that the 1100 pieces of silver represent three years? Is that what we're going to do with these with this uh, these pieces of silver? Why? Why would we represent silver as periods of time? Yes. Because we've done that already from Daniel chapter five. So money, any kind of measurement can represent time. <clears throat> so in this situation with their 1100 pieces of silver each mm -hmm. from the conversation that we've had before mm -hmm. your position was that the 1100 pieces was 220 pieces of silver each right yeah okay yet if we had 5,500 pieces of silver mm -hmm. as a total. And I'm, I'm saying 1,100 for each of the Lord of the Philistines. Yeah. That would be 220 pieces of silver multiplied by 25 times. Mm -hmm. So why the symbol of restoration tied with this with the money? Well, this is talking about restoration within this movement. Right. So is that this is being this is being applied ironically. Well, no, what we're doing is we're taking the symbols, we're ignoring the moral aspects of the story. Okay. Right. So yeah, so I guess you could say when we look at the symbols, we take the symbols as what they mean in a straightforward way. 
ignoring, you know, what these people represent in that sense, right? What they represent morally. So we ignore the moral aspects. Well, so we, okay. So but you I'm... see that the five, this is going to represent the five whys, right? Because that's, that's how we would understand it. This is about this movement. And so this movement, it's about its restoration. So if each of the five whys has 200, and they're offering 220 pieces of silver, then, it, yeah, we, we could say we're looking at it ironically. I, guess. I have to say that we'd be looking at, at it ironically because we are applying the moral aspect when we do. Okay. So when we're looking at it straightforward, mm -hmm. the, the situation is that the, the lords of the Philistines are saying, be restored to us. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at it ironically, then it, yes, it is in the movement that we're, we're having to make this application, but what are we being restored to? We don't want to be restored to the church. We're looking to be restored to Christ. Wouldn't that be correct? Yes. And, and to the message of the pioneers. Agreed. Right. So to me, the restoration here is about, about these messages. Right. So these are all, all about messages, not about people. Though people are connected to messages. And we can see with Delilah, she has the symbol there of... Um, of being like literally she's feeble right but she's going to be strengthened and it's through this message and then we have these these four tests okay right? so we have the three angels messages we have symbols of the parable of the ten virgins all of this is being representative of millerite history being repeated in our time that's how I understand uh, the story of Samson, and particularly this story of Delilah. Okay. So, going back then to 16.5, lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. Mm -hmm. How many steps is that? Entice him, see what to, and see strength. Nice. So they're going to entice him. Um, all five? Depends how you count it. I'm seeing four. Okay. Entice him. Because entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth. Could be one and two, by which means we may prevail would be three, that we may bind him to afflict him would be four. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just uh, looking at the five verbs. I'm not disagreeing with that point. I'm looking at the overall action. Yeah. Yeah. So I look at entice. We have to see where his great strength lies. Uh, understand by what means we may prevail, that we may bind him, and also afflict him. So, so it's either four or five. You can even count it as three if you group some of them together. But well, okay. So the.
the way that I'm approaching this and being led to approach this is the enticement in a manner of speaking could be the equivalent of fear God. Okay. So you're taking these as the four angels messages. Exactly. Because prevailing against becomes operative when we're looking at this as being a symbol of the third angel's message. Because the whole thing is that when we see the hour of God's judgment, you are either prevailing against Satan or you are ignoring the offer of God. And the affliction becomes that of the judgment. The Revelation 18. That's just just the way that I'm looking at this here. Yeah. Okay. So, see, I see this as um, the story of Christ on the first level. No disagreement on that. So, you know, we can see, like, the entice, that's the temptation in the wilderness, right? Um, so this whole this whole thing enticed him to see wherein his great strength lieth. Um, and, the, you know, the purpose is they're going to bind him and afflict him, right? So this is in, he's afflicted, right, at the cross. Okay. Um, so, so that's kind of how I see it. I wasn't really looking at, at the number of things and trying to figure out what the number is. Um, but this is for restoration, right? This is going to be about um, restoration. We also know that 11 of the disciples are, are saved. One is lost. Correct. So we have that 11 there representing the, the disciples. Um, could it be an hour before midnight? Well, 11 could be an hour before midnight as well, because he's going to arise at midnight. So that could be that as well. But does he arise at midnight in this chapter, or did that take place in the previous chapter? Um, well, that was that was earlier in this chapter. Okay, right. agreed. But but yeah, we can still overlay overlay things over top of each other. Okay, right. Um. Yeah, so we can compare this with Isaiah 53. But the, the previous comment from the chat was that we needed to compare Judges 16.5 with Judges 6.12. And why, why should we do that? Well, in one of them, there's a query about where we want to know where his strength lies. And then in uh, Judges 6, 12, it said, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Is what I was saying is the Lord is our strength. So I'm just trying to connect all these verses together. Yeah. All right. When we're looking at this more in the ironic sense, we're able to see that there is a call to being restored through the message, through the efforts of Christ, not through our own efforts. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you've got 
you've got your money that gets brought into play. Right. And um, so this story here, I mean, because we know that Samson represents Christ, but also represents this message. So this message is a message of restoration. Right. You know, one of the things that people, you know, brought an argument against this movement, you know, especially dealing with the 2520, was that in the charts, you know, uh, this is all just prophecy. There's nothing about the cross of Christ. And, of course, if you look at the 1843 chart, the cross is the center. Um, and I, I remember it was actually my first meeting I went to in Oklahoma. I think it was the French speaker. Uh, who who pointed out that the cross was the center of the charts. But, you know, in everything that I've studied in prophecy, it's always been about the cross of Christ. I mean, sure, we have on the, on the surface, we have all these different dates and spans of time, but everything always is tied to the cross. We see that in Daniel chapter 9, um, the 70 weeks. It's going to be dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to be dealing with the, dis um, the destruction of the temple, the city, and the sanctuary. But the whole center of everything is the cross. And, you know, just like in the, the, the verses before in chapter 16, you know, with the gates and the posts. I mean, this is about, about the cross. You know, Christ is carrying the cross and placing it on the top of a hill. You know, because that's what Samson's doing. So he's representing Christ dying for our sins. And so we can see that all, all the way through. Um, so I, I think it's pretty significant um, that, that we have these lines, this line upon line is really representing Prophecy is representing salvation. It's not just to know what's going to happen in the future. More than anything else, prophecy is supposed to give us the bedrock understanding so that we can have faith in the word of God and in God himself, right? Yeah. When we have that faith in God himself, we also have that faith in Christ because he's represented throughout the prophecies. Mm -hmm. All the prophecies point to Christ. I mean, he's the word of God, but he's embodied in the scriptures, in the, the prophecies of scriptures, in his own word. Right. Ellen White does that comparison. She talks about how uh, divinity and humanity combined do not commit sin. And she applies that to the scriptures as well. Thus, you know. The words of men become the perfect word of God. Where she talks about inspiration and how it works. So we know that Adventism teaches thought inspiration. Ellen White doesn't teach thought inspiration. Because with thought inspiration, then you can say, well, the, the Bible's imperfect, right? Because men just are inspired to... Their thoughts are inspired and they write things down, but it has all kinds of human error in it. But Ellen White's quite clear that, that this is actually God speaking to us through the human agents. So just like divinity and humanity combined do not commit sin, the same with God's word. It's without error. Right. Right. So the, the huge difference by twisting Ellen White's words to try to support their ideas of inspiration. 
Now, um, so a couple of things. So when we look at uh, the number of days, so when we take 1100 and we divide it by a Julian year, 365.25, we get three years plus um, 4.25 days, which is uh, 2,160 minutes, which is that 216 that we saw, or, or pardon me, 6,100 6, and 6,120 minutes. And that 6,120 minutes, that's that Judges 612 that uh, Angela pointed us to, 612. Um, now, another thing that's interesting, if we take um, this uh, 11, now Jesus was sold for how many pieces of silver? Wasn't it 30? Yeah, so 30 pieces of silver. And if you divide 1,100 by um, 30, you get 36.6, etc. right? So, so that is the 36 with the 66666 at the end. This is a symbol of, of this is a conflict of these, these symbols, right? And if right. you take 220, um, and you divide it by 36.666, you get six. So that is, if we take, um, you know, so when we look at this symbol, it's going to symbolize restoration. It's also going to symbolize the mark of the beast. So this is this conflict, the great controversy. Yeah, so we have some of these symbols here that Angela puts in there dealing with, uh, if you deal it by three prophetic years, um, you get 1,080 days, which we know ties to the 1440 to give us 2520. So, so we can look at these things. We can see that all these symbols are tied together in the symbols of this movement. We can also see that uh, this movement is about the Sunday law, but it's also about the restoration of the image of God in man. And all of these things are tied up here in this story with the 1100 pieces of silver. Now, these are going to be paid to Delilah. So Delilah represents what? There's multiple things that she represents. Well, she's a woman. Yeah, she does represent multiple things. So she's a woman. So she represents the church. church. Now, the church, of course, doesn't mean the Seventh-day Adventist church. It just, just means this enfeebled church, whatever that is. And that would be God's people that are enfeebled. She has the symbol of 1870 because of the, the Hebrew number for her name. 187. So 1807 is the number. So that represents July 18th. Um, and she's being offered 1,100 pieces of silver. Right. Okay. So, so this 1100 pieces of silver, however we look at it, it still represents 220 restoration. It represents the price paid for Christ in that calculation that gives us other symbols. You know, Christ was made a curse for us when he died upon the cross. So, so there's lots of symbols in here. We have Delilah, which we believe is representing this movement in the aspect of this relationship with Samson. So Samson, we believe, is a message. But Delilah is also a message. Agreed. Right. 
even though it represents a church as a symbol, it represents a message. And it's a message that's going to restore us, even though here it says she's enfeebled. We can see the symbols of ref restoration are being offered to her. And then this is going to result in, in these tests. So these tests are, are way marks within this movement. Um, and, and, and when we look at Judges 16.6, right, I said that that's FFA, just backwards, right? Because one represents A, six represents F. Um, so I've, I've tried to look at this in different ways, but what if, what if we took this as representing um, uh, what happened with FFA on December 6th, uh, 2020? Could we do that? Is that like the first test? Uh, I'm just thinking of this now, so. It could very well be. Okay. All right, so. So it's they're going to ask Delilah to test Samson, and it's and then he's going to. Um, the, so she's going to then and in sixteen verse six, she wants to know. So she's going to ask him directly. Um, and asking you know where wherewith thou mightest be bound, right? Because they want to know. She wants to know, and they want to know how can they bind. Samson so that they can afflict him and wasn't this really what was happening with FFA in their declaration in their their examination does that make sense what I'm asking Because they set up this committee, which was, of course, already stacked with people who agreed with their conclusion. So it wasn't a true examination of, of July 18. Right. It never was. No. So it was, it was, just, a, it was just a sham. They weren't honestly trying to find the answer. They were just trying to trap us so to speak so what about this binding with seven green widths these these bowstrings what does it mean that samson gives this this message about the seven green widths well would that be similar to the uh, correlation that was being made with July 18th having to deal with the seven times of Leviticus 26? Okay. Yeah, and I know it, and it's hard to kind of look at this because, you know, Samson is this message. And, you know, what we were doing, okay, let, let's try to remember back what was happening at that time. So after after July 18, it took some time. They didn't really know what to do. Um, FFA didn't really know what to do. Um, you know, and I'm trying to remember back about their presentations. Um, and I haven't gone back and, and watched them. I don't know if I even have all of their presentations. I, I'd have to try to see. But we kept we kept studying. So we we were doing the the daily morning study. We went through many different things. We went through Acts chapter twenty seven, and what we were looking at was, um, and we did a study on the twenty five twenty as well. We were trying to understand our message. We just went back and looked at what we had done before. We were examining. Uh, the evidence that led to our conclusions. 
And it, it took FFA a while to respond to what was happening. So there was lots of discussions on WhatsApp and, and different sort of um, things that were occurring. But they finally set up this committee. And of course, um, and they wanted, you know, I, I wrote a paper and they wanted to use that paper, you know, as part of the evidence or whatever. And then they tried to use that paper against me, right? Even though there was nothing in that paper that could be used against me because I was very, very clear in that paper about what it was that we had learned by July 18th. So that um, it was about understanding the lines correctly, and that we had misunderstood the lines, that we were expecting an event on July 18th that we shouldn't have expected and we also had this failed prediction uh, line. But um, they tried to use that paper because I've read over, you know, what she says about my paper, what Bronwyn says in her review. And it's like completely like she's not even reading my paper. It was never the intent to read your paper. Right. It was just to try to pick some things from it that they could use. So they weren't looking at any of the arguments I was using. Um, and what what had been taught to us. So so we could look at this as that first test. No, could we are. Okay, so we are. Okay. So then the seven green widths, this would represent the evidence that we present, which has to do with the understanding of how the 2520 is connected with July 18th, and that if we reject July 18th, we reject the 2520. Right. Okay. So, um, so the lords of the Philistines here, I mean, see, this is where we have, because we say there's five, right? So these are going to be from the five cities. That is, these lords are... Um, uh, you know this 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 word Lord here meaning it means an axle figuratively appear. So I'm not you know it doesn't say the kings of the Philistines, but we've taken it as referring to the five kings of the five cities. That's how we've understood it. But. So they bring these seven green widths, and she's going to bind Samson with these. And then you have these men lying in wait. So this this is is also what happened if you want to look at it with that um, like it's a trap. But. The message still survives in spite of what they tried to do. Uh, we're going to see that these, the way they tried to bind us, it, they're not going to prevail. So, so we could say that all represents what happened there with, with FFA. Okay, so if we do that, then we have to take, we have to create with each of these other ones, these tests as well. So then we're going to have these new ropes that were never occupied. So what would they represent? Would these be the lines that that we're currently studying? Okay. And I think that That's makes sense. What I'm thinking. Yeah. So these ropes are lines. Now, that they were never occupied, well, what would that mean in that context? Well, how many, how many of the lines that we're currently studying have ever truly been investigated? Look at the study that we're dealing with right now in the Book of Judges. Mm-hmm. 
has has the book of Judges to your memory or to anyone else's memory that's currently here ever been so deeply investigated, deconstructed, and torn down to see exactly what's being said? Well, no. I mean, I'd never really even studied the book of Judges before, because when I was looking at chronology, all I could see is that I couldn't understand what was going on. We're at the point right now with this, with the book of Judges, in coming to this portion with the study of Samson, Mm -hmm. that I think we're going to be able to see that this example for us is showing us a close of our time currently where the last chapters should have been at the very beginning as we've already agreed Mm -hmm. and would more represent what was happening post 1863 Mm -hmm. yeah so these chapters put in this order is because of our history right Now, so another thing here, when when we look at what happened exactly after December 6th, 2020, is we didn't really have to wait too long. How long did we wait till the bombing of Nashville? I agree it wasn't long, but I don't remember the date. 19, 19 days. Okay. Right? So 19 days later, we're going to have this the bomb that goes off in nashville so that group has already cut themselves off from us was so that an ordinal even, count what's that was that an ordinal count that's just a, a direct so you go six you just t- subtract six from 25 december 20th right. you're going to get 19 so it's cardinal and um so 19 days later we're going to have the bombing in nashville Right. It's going to happen on a Friday. The de- declaration was on a Sunday. Okay, so my my comment, if, yeah. we take, if we take this as an ordinal count. 20. It'd be 20, okay. All okay. right. If it's ordinal, it'd be 20. So we have 19, but we know the significance of 19. Right. Okay. And what we have there then is they've cut themselves off from us. And then we're going to have these new ropes because now we all of a sudden have these new lines. We're going to have December 25th and January 6th. And we're going to be able to connect these uh, with these 187s. So we're going to have like a prophetic mirror because the bombing in Nashville happened what, 187 days after uh, June 22nd? I think that's correct. Right? So you're going to have that. um, And then you're going to have also from uh, July 4th, the end of that 100 days of prayer, you're also going to have 187 days to January 6th, 2021. So we have this this whole structure um, uh, that's given us. And these are the new ropes. Because now we have, um, after the departure of FFA, after we're kicked out, all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of new lines to look at. And so we're going to examine those lines, these new ropes. But we're also going to have liars in wait in this period of time, right? So we're going to go from uh, the declaration in 2006 all the way to December 25th, 2021. And is this message being intact again from within? Okay. You said that the message from December. The, the declaration from December 6th, 2020. 
Okay, you said December 2006. Okay, well, I don't know why I said that. But anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, December 6th, 2020, we have the declaration. And so we're separated from FFA. We have December 25th, 2020. Right. So that's when we're, we're going to have the bombing of Nashville. And then a year later, we're going to have December 25th, 2021. And um, that's going to be the end of our 777 structure. But during that time, do we still have liars and ways within the movement? Yes. Yeah. Because we're going to have all those things that happen regarding um, well, well, me personally. So the attacks that are going to be coming, um, but still attacks upon the message within the movement. So, yeah, and, it, and they're very clandestine attacks. That is, people aren't openly attacking the message. They're not, they're not saying this is wrong, that is wrong, right, in, in an open way. So, so we're going to have that happen. And when we get to December 25th, 2021, the division in the movement is pretty evident. The fact that they don't want to, at the end of our 777 day structure, the movement isn't having meetings together. Now, people of course could blame me for that. They could say, well, you could just join our meetings, which of course we did, but we had that invitation for all of us to work together. And, and that was to be international. Right. So so we did have people from other places, but it would have been much nicer if we had all organized this together. But it wasn't done that way. So those new ropes are these lines that are going to complete the 777 structure. So that would be the second test. And then we're going to have the third one. Now, we, we, we looked at this before, and we looked at the seven locks of his head that are put into this uh, uh, loom, right? So it's going to be woven into the warp and the woof of this uh, loom. Um, we saw this as further evidence of these structures. And, and we can see that's what we had after December 25th, 2021. Didn't we have much more complex lines being intertwined in our study of understanding the lines? Because that's what's going to begin there. So this is the present structure. The present test is what's happening. Okay. So, so that represents this period of time that, that we, we've just ended. So we've had these three tests. And so then when she, it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his, all his heart and said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head. For I've been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my, my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So in this sense, Samson is yielding himself to the control of the Philistines by offering this information. And this is when the money is going to be brought into their hand. So what does this portion parallel in your mind? Well, I think it parallels with what happened um, in December 25th, 2022. Because this is the humiliation of Samson. 
And I believe that that's where we came to um, as we, we came through our studies, we saw that we need to come to the upper room. Right. And that we need to yield ourselves to God's will and not fight against, allow God to take control of things. And so, so and I think that the, so, I mean, we know that this story is like this negative thing, but if it's Christ submitting to the cross, then that's what we have to do. And I believe that's what we are doing. You know, joining once again our brethren in uh, their studies. You know, and, and I had a talk with Colin, and 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 he says that you know we need, do need to study together, even though that we disagree with some points. So, I think this is where the movement has to be. Now he's going to be bound, right? And these fetters of brass, and he's going to grind in the prison house. But yeah, this is Christ submitting to Herod and Caiaphas and Pilate and their thugs, I guess. And when we look at Judges 16, 18, um, it says, When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. So this, is, so this would be a very specific point where this 1,100 pieces of silver is being brought. And it's being brought in a verse that refers to the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, right? One, six, one, eight. So the symbol of this money in relation to the, mes the message of this movement. How do we approach it? Well, I've just taken it as being three years, four and a quarter days. Right, so that's that's how I've looked at it. So it refers to a period of three years, at least. And we can go from, um, you know, if we're, if we're going to look at the bombing of Nashville, December 25th, right, and you're going to go... 1100 days from there let's say we did that i mean that's going to bring us to um so that's going to bring us to well maybe where where could we place that from so so that's going to bring us to the end of this year december 30th not quite 31st um so this 1,100 pieces of silver would refer to something to do with this movement. Right. Right. So, so a period of time. And we say that the story of Judges goes from 2001 to uh, 2023. Right. So if it brings us to the end of 2023. So let's say we go from the time of this study. So this study... Um, no, that would be, that would be this year. So, so we just go to the bombing of Nashville. So the bombing of Nashville, if we go to the end of that day and we count 1100 days, that would bring us to December 31st, 2023. So it refers to this period of time from when, uh, we received this information that began this because without that bombing of nashville and of course january 6th uh 2021 um yeah so panium angela refers to panium right because that's going to be um 
And what's the connection again with Panium and the Fibonacci sequence? It's, what's all the connection there? Matthew 16, 18, right? That's where they're at Caesarea Philippi, which is Panium, right? Everybody it mentions that the that gates of hell. Matthew, yeah, it mentions the gates of hell being being Panium or Panium. Yeah, and we know so that the, the yeah, okay. Right. So the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Upon this rock shall I build my church. Right. And of course, we have Peter there, and his name, if we take the Gematria and we multiply it, we get 144,000. Right. So we're all familiar with that, with Peter's name. And so you're, you're going to have the 144,000 connected to. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence. So if we're going to take Judges 1618, we have to connect it to Matthew 1618. Is that clear to everyone? So going back to this 1,100 pieces of silver, if it represents 1,100 days and we take it from December 25th, 2020, it's going to bring us to the end of 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. So symbolically, it ends this period of time. So, so the one thing that we haven't had, so we've had this date, April, um, April 5th, 2030. And we've seen, you know, it has this symbolic date. But we can see we have another symbolic date here. We can go to the end of this year. And it's going to be the end of the year then that you're going to have this completion of the year of Ezra. So when we get to January 1st, 2024, the divorcement should be complete. Does that seem fair? I know some of this can seem quite tenuous, some of these connections, but... It has an interesting application. Now, the other thing, um, you know, when we go to that December 25th, 2020 date, uh, the date that it is on the biblical calendar is the 10th day of the 10th month, which is the start of the siege. Right. right. So FFA under that first test, they reject the message. And then we, we begin the siege with December 25th, 2020. Um, so there's a number of different... Here again, when you're speaking of the siege, you're speaking of the siege of Jerusalem, right? Right, yeah, in 587 B.C. And how long is it from the beginning of the siege to the end of the siege? Well, it uh, depends how you want to look at, at it. So it, um, it's, you know, we just say it's a year and a half. But on in the biblical reckoning, you know, we because that's what I usually go by. So... Um, So the date, uh, let me see here, I have a chart of it. 
Um, yeah, so it's going to be uh, 18 months and 29 days on the biblical calendar and 18 months and months and 13 days on our calendar. So. So the exact number of days, could figure that out. Yeah, so it's going to be January 5th, 587. And... going to end on July 18 and 586. Um, so 559 days, uh, cardinal count. So. So that siege took a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if it's 560 days, it ends up being, if you divide it by three, so let's say it's, it's, why I'm doing that, I don't know. But if you divide that by uh, three, it's 186 and uh, two-thirds of a day. So 186.666. Um, so sorry for blacking out the screen, but that's my calculator doing that. So anyway, we have symbols there with this time of the siege. There's other things with the siege as well. But if we go from this December 25th date, um, We get, we, you know, we get to the end of 2023. So with the 1100 days, if we do it as I guess, an exclusive count. So that fits in what with, with what we understand about 2023. So God's given us the rest of this year to reconcile, to come to the upper room. And that's going to end up, you know, if we go to December 31st or December 31st is going to be a Sunday. December 30th is a Sabbath. So it could just be the last Sabbath of this year. Maybe by then we're reconciled. Hopefully it's before then, but. <clears throat> I mean, we could say if we're not reconciled by then, we're never going to be reconciled, you know, talking about as individuals. Does any of that seem reasonable? I'm considering it.
your point has a bit of logic to it, but I'm having to consider the way you're approaching it. Yeah, I, I just don't know how else we could apply these tests other than tests for this movement. Tests for the movement, yeah. It's, it, I'm, yeah. I'm having to consider the individuals as you were just speaking of. Well, the fact is not every single one of us is going to be reconciled. You know, if we go to the upper room, not everybody goes to the upper room and is reconciled. Right. Judas doesn't. Of course, he's commits suicide. But. But you understand what I'm saying is that, I mean, this movement is going to be reconciled. You, you have 120 that went to the upper room, 11 of which were the disciples. Yeah. So you have 109 that were not disciples that were part of the upper room experience. Yeah. All I'm saying is that when, when you have the movement reconciles, the movement is going to be it's going to go to the upper room, you know, it's going to be reconciled. We're going to have a message. This work is going to be completed. But as individuals, I mean, there comes a point where you're not going to be reconciled. So obviously we have the movement, but it's up to you individually whether you're going to follow Christ or not. Now we know of this story moves on. So, you know, we're kind of hitting this story with a broad brushstroke to some degree, but we have gone through it and we know that it's going to lead to um, Samson in the temple of Dagon, right? And in, in some ways we can look at that as the Sunday law, correct? Right. Okay, because of all the symbols there. Now, it's also the cross of Christ, but the cross of Christ is the Sunday law. We understand it, that it's the Sunday law is typified by the cross. So, so this movement is, is being led by, by God, even though we're... Uh, we're weak, right? Even though we're morally weak. But we are going to stand in the end and declare God's truth. We're going to represent Christ. I mean, that to me is what the story of Samson has been showing us. But I know we're we're skipping some of these details. Um, even when we deal with the um, this, when he's going to get the seven locks cut off his head, what would that mean? Because this is his humiliation, right? <laughs> Perhaps the crown of thorns. Okay, what, what's that, Angela? I said perhaps the crown of thorns. Okay. I mean, this is representing our humiliation. It's representing a cross. She's going to afflict him, right? The seven locks of his head. And we understand these represent um, the seven times, right? Right. And we also have here in the, in the word head, we have all the symbols of July 18, 2020, 7218 is the Hebrew number. Um, and he's going to be asleep upon her knees when she, in each of these situations. Uh, 
And when, when, uh, when he's asleep up on her knees, a man is going to come and shave off the seven locks of his head. So who is this man? Well, in Christ's case, that was Satan who led them off, who was inspiring, inspiring those foes of Christ to do what they did. But in our, our case, I guess people that choose not to be like Jesus, I guess, don't want to follow him. Well, okay, but see, I would, I would look at it morally ironic. So wouldn't this be Christ? That's possible. Mm -hmm. It's like the dirt brush man. This is an understanding that's going to come to this movement. Okay, I get your point. <laughs> it's just funny. Where is he going with this? Yeah, yeah I see your point, Theodore. Yeah. Now, we know, you know, Samson obviously awakes from his sleep each of these times. Right. Anytime he's asleep, he's going to have that where he wakes up at midnight. Um, you know, she's going to be binding him with these things while he's asleep. But here this time he's asleep and and she's going to call for a man to come and shave off these seven locks. So so we wouldn't look at this, you know, like a destruction of the seven times or anything. This is an understanding that comes. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing in this understanding of the lines is, is God has been revealing light to us, but we know we don't know enough yet, right? If we knew enough, we could just stop studying. But, but we don't have a message. We don't have an organized movement. And I'm not talking about like, you know, legally organized. I'm just talking about a movement that's working together that's connected with Christ and that's cooperating with each other and cooperating with Christ. So, so we don't have that, have that. Um, now, one of the things here too, in 1620 that we see is he says, um, when he, he wakes out of his sleep, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And we, we talked about this before, this being the shaking. Right? Okay. Now, this word, um, shake, is like the idea of the rustling of a mane, which usually accompanies the lion's roar. So how would we understand this then? Oh, Revelation 7, 3. He cried with a loud voice when the lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Yeah, so we can see that this relates to the proclamation of the message. So this this fits in with, with my idea is that we, this movement, the reason that we have to come together is we have to have a united message and that means we have to humble ourselves as we study together you know because if we go to a study and we have our conclusions already settled and that we're just trying to convince other people of what we understand 
were no different than the December 6th, uh, 2020 declaration, the, the committee that produced that declaration, correct? And, and notice the word hair. Um, it mentions in 622, 1622, but I'm going to take the last part as 622. That's the symbol for FFA. Howbeit the hair of his head, notice the Hebrew number, 8181. So what's 81 represent? Midnight. Okay, and a doubling. So can we see that by the end of 2023, by the end of this year, this movement should have a message to give that we would call that of the message at midnight, right? The midnight cry. That coincides with Luke 1. Okay, so Luke chapter 1, which verse? The whole message comes to 2023. Okay. When the Holy Spirit works with us and we, and then John is born, so the call will go out. Okay. Okay. Not fully sure I understand how this relates to Luke 1. But yeah, you can have John the Baptist is going to be born. And then the birth of Jesus foretold. You'd have to put it on a line. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we're going to have this as being the midnight cry message developed, I mean, the next part is going to be the Sunday law, because that's what the death of Samson is going to represent there's lots of symbolism in there so so i think that we're 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 on the right track in how we're understanding this because it does repeat this history but it's specifically the history of these of this movement from December, well, we would say December 6, 2020 is that first test. Um, so it, it sort of does a repeat and enlarge after it brings us to Colin and Odilio's messages, particularly Colin's message. And then we have this. Um, this message being tested. So it repeats some of that history, but it's basically this period of um, three years. Any other thoughts? before we close with prayer.
Now, um, Dwight, just going back to your inclusive count of the 20 days. Right. So what if we took the three to represent three prophetic years? So we take 1,100 days. Right. And if we go from December 25th to December 25th, that's three years. So we could go December 25th, 2020 to December 25th, 2023. And then we have 20 days left over. And so that 20 days left over could go back to December 6th. Right. And then to December 25th and then three years to the. And that would be consistent having these December 25ths uh, lining up from, you know, 2020, 2021, 2022, and then 2023. So it's just a thought. Sure. But that's just using the, the prophetic year of three years. Right, so I'm taking 1100, dividing it by 360, getting three years and 20 days. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for how you lead as we study. We know that we are very dependent upon you for light and for strength. We ask, Lord, that you can help us as we continue to struggle with self and with the situations around us. Help us, Lord, to cling to you and to your word, to be obedient in all things. Be with each person. Watch over them. May your angels guard and protect them. And um, we ask that you can bring us together again to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.